And uh, tonight I want to urge upon us prayer for the unconverted and particularly for the unconverted who are our loved ones. Remember last week, I think we examined that passage in Luke 18 from verse 1, where we are urged to pray without ceasing. Um, our persistent praying based not on a perception of God as being hard and reluctant and hesitant, but rather as being a loving father as contrasted with the difficult judge. God is not like that difficult judge. He's more than willing to hear our prayer. So we were urged to pray without ceasing. Eh? And uh, one of the things we are to pray for without ceasing is our loved ones. I remember earlier today, now that he's coming, I was on a phone call with him, uh, trying to condole with him because of the bereavement they've had as a family, the loss of their beloved auntie. And one of the things that we remember speaking to each other was that when our loved ones that pass on like that, it reminds us that we don't have all that time with them. They might leave us any time. It doesn't matter how old or how young they are. Young people die and old people die. And uh, yeah, and so we must pray then for our loved ones, particularly that they might be saved and do so with urgency, with earnestness. Now, God in his own time brings forth the fruit. Sometimes we are able to see that fruit. Sometimes we will not see it. Sometimes that food comes through our own preaching, for example, those who preach like ourselves, or if you witness to your loved ones, and God may choose to use your witness to them to bring them uh, to saving faith. Sometimes the fruit will be, rather the harvest will be brought in through the labors of others, long after you're gone. Now, we do not know how that will happen, when it will happen, by whom it will happen, but we do know one thing for sure, that it is ours to put in the work, right? And that work doesn't begin with evangelizing them. We must evangelize them. We must witness to them. We must speak with them. But it does not begin there. It begins with us praying for them. I don't know who said this, but I think what he said is true, that speaking to God about people must always precede our speaking to people about God. I think that's true. That our speaking to people about God must be preceded by our speaking to God about them. Because surely we know the kind of people we are speaking to about God. They are the same people described in Romans 1. Who verse 18 suppress the truth of God in their unrighteousness. Right? Who, though they know God in his various attributes revealed in nature, they either worship him, no, honor him as God. They are the same ones we are told that they in fact exchange the truth of God for a lie. 
consider themselves to be wise, they become fools. Paul speaks about them in 2 Corinthians 4, I think, in verse 3, 4, he says that they are blinded by the God of this world. They can't see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So verse 5 tells us that there is some supernatural power, verse 5 and 6, which might, must intervene ahead of time before they can actually respond to the gospel message. Such language is still used in Ephesians 2. They are dead in trespasses and sins. They need a raising from the dead. Um, 4 verse 17, 18. Their ignorance, their hearts are callous. So I was speaking to people, somebody has described it as a graveyard ministry. We are speaking to the dead. There's no life in them. So how can we do that and expect that a response, a positive response will emerge out of such a heart? That is why our speaking to them must be preceded by our speaking to God on their behalf. Because God must go ahead of us. God must uh, speak with that voice that raises the dead. Now, that's what I want us to see. I want to urge upon us that as we pray without ceasing, and I know it's easy to pray for many things without ceasing. If you're, you don't have a job, you're praying for a job. Ah, that's easy. Because every night you go on an empty stomach to bed, it's a reminder to pray for a job. That's easy. Yeah? If you're sick, your pain compels you to pray, even when you don't feel like praying. But very often the affairs of others, and especially if those affairs are not of the temporal kind, of the immediately visible kind, then we do not have as much impetus to pray for them. So we need that encouragement every once in a while. And we get that encouragement from the example of the Apostle Paul. And we see that example in uh, his words to the Romans as he writes in chapter 10. So let's look at Romans chapter 10. Um, I'm reading verse 1 to 4. But really, Paul's example of zealous prayer for our loved ones is to be found in verse 1. But for purposes of context, uh, let's look at verse 1 to 4. It says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. So you see it there in verse 1. Paul is writing to the Roman Christians. These are his brethren, his brothers according to the flesh, in the sense that they are Jews the way he is a Jew. No, I'm sorry. He's writing to brothers in the faith. Okay? Because even though they are not Jews like him according to the flesh, in Christ they are brothers. So he's writing the Romans. It's a mixed church. Jews, Gentile. Yeah. But what brings the brotherhood between Paul and these dear ones is the bonds he has with them in Christ. They are children of God and he is a child of God and that makes them brethren, brothers. So he's writing to people he has spiritual bonds with. 
And as he writes to them, he exposes the desire of his heart. He exposes the desire of his heart. And that desire is expressed in prayer. And it is for his brethren of a different kind. Now, he is writing to his spiritual brethren, those who, though not Jews, but are believers. They are children of Abraham through faith, as Paul himself is. He is writing to them about his other brethren, that is his brethren in the flesh, the Israelites. And his prayer is that they might be saved. So obviously there is a heart desire. That's what we see. There's a heart desire. That heart desire is expressed in earnest prayer. It's a prayer for those who are related to him by blood. They are Jews like it is. And the reason for that prayer, or rather what he would like to see as the result of his praying is that these people might be saved. Okay? So in a nutshell, that's what I want us to look at. And it's really straightforward. The first question then is, do we have a genuine desire, as obviously does Paul, for the salvation of our loved ones? Do we? Do you? May I ask you that? Does it give you sleepless nights that your mom, your sister, your brothers, cousins, maybe your friends, people who are loved ones in one way or the other, does it disturb you that they are not converted, that they are yet in their sins? Is that a matter of concern for you? Because that's what Paul expresses here as his heart's desire. They are not saved. He wants them saved. Now Paul understands what it means when someone remains unsaved. What does it mean? It means, first of all, that they remain in their sins. It means that they are yet not forgiven of their sins. It means they are at enmity with God. Let me say it in a more horrific way. God is at enmity with them. Because very often when we speak about us being at enmity with God, we think about how we feel towards God or our disposition towards God. And that's bad. That's bad enough. It's bad enough that we don't love God as sinners. It's bad enough that we don't want to obey His law. It's bad enough that we, we reject Him. That other than the good things that He can give us, yeah, we want to have nothing to do with Him. That's bad enough. But has it ever occurred to you that by the virtue of who He is, that is His nature, God doesn't want anything to do with sinners either. He's a holy God, the just God. His holiness cries out for the judgment, the punishment of sinners. His holiness holds those who break his law at arm's length, you cannot come here. 
That's what his holiness requires. And his justice requires that he must recompense them. He must pay them the wages of their sins. In Genesis 3, we speak about the fall. And as soon as Adam fell into sin, he has God coming towards him and his wife and they ran away from God. They did run away. They did not want to have anything to do with God at that point in time. But that's not all. God catches up with them. God speaks to them. You know those words, read them in Genesis 3. But at the end of that episode, something else is told us. That after God was done talking to them, God sent them away from the garden. Now the garden was representative of God's presence. The place of God's blessing. So initially it was them running away from God. Now it is God chasing them away. And I think we need to think about enmity, the enmity that exists between man and God, or God and man, in those terms as well. Don't merely think of it in terms of your disposition or your feelings towards God. Because if you think about it only from that perspective, then you have this idea, ah, because these are my feelings towards God, I can change them anytime I want. No, but let's even assume that you wanted to change your feelings and your disposition toward God, which you can't. But let's say for argument's sake that you wanted to do that. That's not all that is required for your salvation. It requires that God's disposition towards you is also changed, isn't it? Yeah. You may want him, but does he want you? No. We don't want him. But even if we really did want him, does he want us? You know, by virtue of his nature, he shouldn't want us because we are evil, he is holy. Now, with these many words, I'm making the point that it is important, it is important that we understand the danger that sinners face. And I'm talking here about Sinners who also happen to be our loved ones. They are at enmity with God. God is at enmity with them. The psalmist says that God is angry with sinners every day. The psalmist goes ahead to say that God has prepared the instruments of war against them. Do we think of our relatives like that? Be they our children, our parents, our our friends, that these people, even as we speak, are under the wrath of God, under the judgment of God. They are dancing dangerously, very close to the abyss, if I may call it that, of God's judgment. At any moment, says uh, Jonathan Edwards in his famous sermon, Sin in the hands of an angry God, they might, they are. Feet might slide and they find themselves in an eternity. In a, is that how we think about our loved ones who are yet to be converted? Do we think of them as headed straight to hell? Or are we somehow deluded that the warmth of feelings that we have towards them, God shares in those? No, he doesn't. He doesn't. Now, it is these sort of thoughts about the predicament, the plight of our loved ones, sinners who are our loved ones in God's presence, that will stir up this desire that the Apostle Paul is talking about. Here. Yeah. Now, these people are resting easy in some delusion that merely because they are children of Abraham, they have some special title to the favor of God. And Paul knows that that is far from the truth. Okay? And he knows they are aging towards hell with the passing of every minute, every second. So here he talks about a heart's 
desire, in that the King James uses heart's desire. Some of those translations might talk about earnest desire. Okay? Yeah, it is something that he desires from the depth of his being. Now look at how he uses another way to express the same. In the previous chapter, just talking about the desire of Paul for the salvation of his Jewish brethren and where that desire is coming from. In chapter 9 and verse 1 says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. He is being as solemn as he can be. What he's going to tell us in the next verse is the absolute truth. There is no error, no lie in it. That I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Now, whenever he thinks of his Jewish brothers, that's what he feels. His heart is heavy, heavy with sorrow. Why is it heavy with sorrow? Because he knows these guys are not in a good place. Now, that's how we must feel. Whenever we think of our unconverted loved ones, our hearts must grow heavy with sorrow. Now Paul speaks of the depth of his sorrow in verse 3. Very, 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 very extreme terms. He says, For I could wish that I myself were a cast from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now Paul is basically making the point here that if it were possible for me to, you know, he's in a good place, he's a Christian, he's headed to heaven. His name is in the Lamb's book of life and he knows it. And Paul is saying that I wish for the sake of my brothers according to the flesh. If it is impossible for me to be saved and they be saved so we are both in heaven, I'd rather God strikes me off from the book of life and replaces me with them. Now, why is he using such extreme language? Now, you might call it hyperbole, and it could very well be, but it expresses the depths of weight, of desire that he has for his people. And I've argued a few moments ago, that such a heaviness of heart, such an earnestness of desire arises from, first of all, his sheer love for them, he is after the highest good, and he knows whatever else he does for them, he is not helping them, he is not doing them any good if they remain under the wrath of God, under the judgment of God, if they remain in a state whereby they are at enmity with God and God at enmity with them. So it chapter 10 talks about his heart's desire, his earnest desire. Do you have that towards those you consider your loved ones? Now we might answer yes. To that and then what are you doing what is it that you are so anxious to bring to them and you can mention many things oh i love them so much i want to give them a good education that's a good thing i mean for a parent to desire good education for his children good thing i try to do that all the time i take them to school pay fees under difficult circumstances yeah when they are dropping the ball i challenge them i charge them i'm hard on them Okay, try to squeeze the best out of them because I love them. That's what we do. Give them good health when they are sick, you rush them to hospital. And I've known quite a bit of that lately. Yeah, if they need surgery, you organize that however much it costs because you love them. If their lives are endangered by the illness, and there is some medicine that can better their life, ease their pain, 
prolong their life even. You spend, you spend, and you're willing to be spent to make those available to them. It's a good thing. That's what family do for each other. We love them. And we love them with a passion. And so we, we work towards the, the, what we consider to be the best things in life. Obviously, we give them food and, and all that. But are any of those things the highest good you can ever seek for someone you love? Consider the words of Christ. What would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lost his own soul? If we might put those words in our context, what profit are you to somebody if you offered them everything they need on this earth? And you do nothing by way of benefiting their eternal souls. Are you doing them any good in the final analysis? And the answer is no. That's what Paul is saying here. He has an honest desire from the heart to see the salvation of his own people. And so it must begin there. Okay? It must begin there. An honest desire from the heart that is driven by the fact of our love for them and the fact of what we know to be their highest good, which is the forgiveness of their sins, the acceptance with God. Now, in the second place, then, we see that it is this honest desire that drives Paul to his knees to pray. He understands their needs. He desires to have that need met. He knows that as a person, because by experience, Paul, the moment he was converted, the people he was engaging with at the very early stages of his conversion were his fellowships. Honestly preaching to them, you know, and he did that again and again, much resistance and opposition. Until such a time that he has had so much resistance from them that he sort of shakes off the dust from his boots and says, I now go to the Gentiles. Yeah, but he, he presented the gospel and he did everything he could but it was met with resistance again and again and again because for someone to respond to the gospel positively yes we've got to do the best we can to give them the gospel but it takes the work of God so Paul says here he goes on his knees to pray If you claim then that you have such a desire to see the salvation of your loved ones, my next question would be, are you praying for them towards that end? Paul prayed. Christ prayed. Remember he talked about Peter. In Luke 22, verse 32, Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. He prayed for Peter. He loved him enough to pray for him. Before he goes to the cross, in John 17, one of his last acts before his arrest was to make that very long high priestly prayer. For the church and he prays for the disciples and he prays for those who would believe from the witness of these disciples in all ages he prays now he knows he's going to the cross to die to pay for their sins he's going to send out his disciples in matthew 28 to go and now make disciples take the gospel but he prays. 
Because our Lord Christ understands, and the Apostle Paul understands, and we must understand, we must understand rather, that it takes the interposition of the power from on high to produce any response to the gospel. Men's hearts are hard by nature. Men are rebels against God. They are hostile. The natural mind, Paul says, is at enmity with God. It does not accept the things of God. It cannot accept the things of God. Something supernatural must be done. So we must pray that that supernatural power moves. The psalmist says that God's people will be made willing or will come to God, will offer themselves to God willingly, but only in the day of God's power. The power of God has to move to cause them to be willing. For it is God at work in you both to make you willing and able to do of his good pleasure. Unless a man is born again, they cannot understand and they cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless they are born from above, unless God performs a heart surgery, as it were, removes the heart of stone and replaces it in them with a heart of flesh, nobody is going to be converted. And there are many examples of this kind in the Bible when Jesus Christ performs miracles of raising the dead. He calls them forth from the graves. And how does the dead man come walking? A power went ahead right? and raised them from the dead before they came. He, he meets with a man with a withered hand. And he says to him, stretch your arm. And a few seconds ago he couldn't. But now he does. A power has gone forth. No human being has any natural ability to come to God. God must bring them. And because we do know that, we plead earnestly with God that he would do that which only he can do. Now we, we preach to them and we bring them under the influence of the gospel. We invite them to services and to evangelistic meetings. We give them tracts. Yeah? We flip the channels on the TV or the radio to where the gospel is being preached when they are seated because we want to influence what they see, what they hear, what they read. That they, they might come across the gospel, but unless God moves by his supernatural power, nobody is saved. Nobody is saved. And so we pray for our loved ones. Now, if you look at verse 2 to verse 4, just a few comments about this before we wrap this up. You notice that uh, the particular difficulty of the people for whom Paul is praying is laid out there. And I think it's important when we are praying for, for our, our loved ones to be converted that we know precisely uh, some of the barriers. We know, we know that they are captives of Satan, we know that. There are many things that particularly make their salvation that much harder, humanly speaking. Okay, well, we do know. Yeah? I mean, you know your father, you know your mother, you know your brothers, you know your sisters, you know your friends. Yeah? And those, the enemy keeps all of them from coming to the Lord. Many factors keep them. But those factors tend to manifest in different ways with different people. And it is, I think, important that when you're praying for somebody to be converted, that you are aware of some of the factors, some of the special circumstances that fuel their rebellion against God, that uh, cause them to be puffed up with pride that they do not respond to the call of the gospel. Things that distract them, steer them away. And Paul is very clear about what that is here. And so he identifies 
the particular issues. And I, 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 I take it that these are the things that Paul was mentioning to the Lord as he prayed. Now, these are not peculiar to the Jews. Uh, but they could be to many of us in one way or another. But one of them is ignorance. He realizes that these people, even though they are zealous for God, as he, as he mentioned in verse, in verse 2, they are a very religious people, but their religious zeal is devoid of knowledge. Yeah. They know anything and everything except that which matters most. So they have religious zeal without saving knowledge. Saving knowledge has to do with the righteousness of Christ. Now if you look at that word, the righteousness of Christ, in the context of which Paul is using, in particular in the book of Romans, he's referring to that righteousness, that alien we call it, righteousness that Christ or that God gives to every sinner who turns away from their sin and puts their faith in Christ. It's a righteousness that is procured through the perfect obedience of Christ, who was born of a woman, Galatians 4.4, 4, born under the law, tried, tempted, tested, in every way just like we are under that law, yet he was found to be perfect without sin. That way he procured a righteousness, a perfect record, which alone qualifies any man to stand accepted by God. And the Jews are ignorant of that. Now that of course is coupled with that which Christ dies in paying for our sins by his suffering and death. So that he, he accepts the wages of our sins on his body by receiving the punishment due to those sins. And then he offers us his perfect righteousness and with it all the blessings that God promises for such righteousness. The work of Christ in general is what these people are ignorant about. They do not know the gospel. They are churchgoers. They are religious people but who are ignorant as regards the gospel. So we pray that the gospel will be made clear to them. We pray that they will be exposed to it. Yeah. And we pray that they will be exposed to it not just outwardly through the preaching, but that their heart will be opened by God to it. Like God opened the heart of Lydia. That they might see the glory of God. In other words, the glorious work that God has done for sinners in Christ. So he, he identifies this ignorance, this ignorance of the work of God in Christ for sinners. And he identifies that that ignorance then expresses itself in doubling down on religious zeal. Because they are ignorant of this, they are now trying to establish their own righteousness killing themselves to keep the Ten Commandments and hoping that by so doing they'll find acceptance with God. <clears throat> and they really believe that they can earn the favor of God by what they do, by how much compliant they are to the law of Moses. And so they keep at it morning, noon and night. They are at it. And their ignorance of that which God offers freely in Christ. And I suspect that this formed a huge part of Paul's prayer. Now, it's not just what I suspect. I mean, you get clues about this in the various letters that he writes uh, to the churches. These are mostly gentle churches. Uh, for example, the Ephesians. And part of what Paul is very big on is that God would open the eyes of our understanding, isn't it? Yeah, praise for the Ephesians letter. Because the problem that is here talked about as belonging to the Jews or bedeviling the Jews is really a universal problem. Our love problems. 
Every sinner is ignorant of the work of God in Christ. And so we are praying that God will expose them to the gospel, that God will open their hearts and their minds and their eyes to see the glorious gospel. That, that's that's the, at the heart of the problem that Paul has identified. This is going to form part of his place. So we, we identify those special circumstances that we believe or think are working against the souls of our people. And we pray, we plead with God that he would uh, address and redress those circumstances. And then, of course, in verse 4, he put forward an emphatic solution. This is what he would like to see. As God deals with the ignorance of the people, that he would open their eyes to see but not what they do, not the labors of their hands can fulfill the demands of God's law. But I'm sure Paul prayed that they would come to know that Christ, that Christ has become the end of the law. He has fulfilled the law so that through him and what he has done, we can receive the righteousness that we need. So he's praying that your eyes will be opened to see Christ and to see what Christ has done and to submit themselves to that. To come off of their high horses of arrogance, rejecting the righteousness of God and to surrender to that which God has done. And so what I'm saying to you that is Paul has an earnest desire for the salvation of his people, born of a very keen understanding of their plight if they remain unsaved. And then that desire is expressed in this heartfelt prayer. And it's prayer that obviously will be very much aware of the particular circumstances that Paul would have addressed as regards his brethren. What I'm saying to you is, if we desire to see the salvation of our loved ones, let's pray for it. And let's pray with some specificity. In other words, let's pray for them specifically. So as we pray, if you're a parent like me and you have children who are unconverted, one of the things I'm praying about is that God, please remove these assumptions that are in their minds and hearts that salvation can be hereditary. Those notions can be with our children. And they think, oh, daddy is a pastor, therefore I'm, I'm in. I'm good. I mean, there's no way God will send me to hell and my father is going to heaven. Ah, Pana. So such notions, I, I pray, oh God, deliver them from, from such. And yours may be the religious kind who go to church often and they engage in church activities and they're relying on those, that you pray particularly about those things that God tear down, tear away, strip away all these things that make them feel safe. And you pray those things away from you. Honestly. That's what Paul does. And so, what I'm imagining then is that we, by the grace of God, have a heartfelt desire for the salvation of our loved ones. That desire must be expressed in strong action on our knees as we pray for them. And that, that prayer should be very targeted at what we know to be the very specific circumstances that God will deal with those circumstances and draw them to himself. May the Lord help us then to be such as Paul was who desires earnestly, prays persistently and even preaches powerfully in order to see the salvation of his love. May the Lord help us to be that kind of a church, that kind of a people, 
Now, I've been very specific about our loved ones here, but of course, you can widen that. Yeah. Um, by, by our loved ones, I was referring more to those of our immediate circle. But does the Bible tell us that our neighbor is anybody who is in need of our help at any one given time? Yeah, it doesn't have to be a blood relative. We go to love. We go to be like that. That's a man. He didn't know the the, the good Samaritan. He didn't know that the, the guy was robbed, but he loved him enough to go out of his way. So we can widen that. But let's pray for the salvation of people, because we know only the work of God in their hearts can actually bring them to the saving knowledge of Christ. May the Lord help us to put those words in our minds and our sins to act accordingly for His glory. Amen.